John the Apostle, as a disciple of Jesus, was an eyewitness to the greatest miracles the world has ever seen. But he was also privileged to see the prophetic future and the grand finale that will occur here in the Valley of Armageddon, next on The Prophetic Connection. The Apostle John with his brother James were two of Jesus' original 12 disciples. The Bible tells us that they worked in their father Zebedee's fishing business on the Sea of Galilee. Until that fateful day, that stranger approached them and said, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And thus began a grand adventure that would take them from Galilee even to Jerusalem itself and they would listen to the words of Jesus and they would see the miracles that he did and their lives were completely transformed. Sadly, tradition says that all of those first disciples were martyred one way or another, all except John, who lived to a ripe old age long enough for Jesus, the risen Lord, to appear to him and give him visions of the prophetic future, which we read about in John's book of Revelation the revelations Jesus of Nazareth revealed to John about the prophetic future. Through John's writings, both in his gospel, his letters, and the book of Revelation, we get glimpses of the Jesus of history, but we also get glimpses of the Jesus who is to come, who is returning to the Holy Land. In fact, he's coming here one day to the Valley of Armageddon. The Apostle John stands out as unique. He is the only prophet to have contributed an entire book of prophecy in the Bible's New Testament. His prophetic book, Revelation, is the last book and grand finale of the Christian canon. John the Apostle, uh, most scholars believe, was the youngest of the 12 apostles. He was a fisherman from Galilee. And he and his brother left everything and uh, left their fishing business and went off to follow Jesus. Jesus had 12 apostles. Among those apostles, there were three very special men, Peter, James, and John. Of those three, he had a very special relationship with John. He was his beloved. For centuries, the writings of John have stood out from among the writings of the other apostles. The five books attributed to him are the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the Revelation to John. John's Gospels include events and people not found in other Gospels. His writings in general are rich in symbolism, known for their deep spirituality and subtle shades of meaning. They seem to reflect the unique and profound relationship he had with Jesus. He was the one disciple that laid his head on the breast of Jesus at the Last Supper. And the Last Supper was a prophetic act by Jesus because the Last Supper was a Passover Seder. They were celebrating the Passover at the very time that the Passover lambs were being slaughtered in the temple nearby. And John was participating in all of that. And I, I have the sense he was like a sponge. He hung on every word Jesus said. The Bible refers to John as the disciple whom Jesus loved. When all of the disciples of Jesus fled during his arrest and trial, John stayed close until his dying breath. John's relationship with Jesus was uniquely intimate and personal, so much so that while dying on the cross, Jesus entrusted his mother's care into John's hands. After the ascension of Jesus, John was a prominent leader of the early Christian movement, and after nearly 12 years of ministry in Judea, persecution drove John out of the promised land, and he settled in Ephesus. John was a real threat to the people, to the authorities, because so many people were coming to the Lord. In Ephesus, there was this huge revival. So they, they incarcerated him on the, on the island of Patmos. And it was there that Jesus chose to actually reappear 
as the resurrected high priest and glorified high priest to who of all people? John. It was John, the beloved, that God chose to bring some of the most marvelous revelations of things to come. When John was on the Isle of Patmos, there in his love for Yeshua, had a intimate encounter with him. And it was at that point that the Lord just downloaded awesome revelations of things to come. Not surprisingly, the risen Jesus appeared to John and revealed to him some of the most profound prophetic revelations recorded in the Bible. John had become a great prophet of God with an important message regarding the future of the world. But of all the messages John received, none remained so important as the one he championed, a message regarding God's love. The legends about John and the church history about John, he was the oldest one, he lived much longer than the others, and he was up in Ephesus as an older elder, in, up in what is today Turkey. And people would come from around the Roman Empire when they heard that one of the apostles was still alive and they would bring him out on a chair and they would say, what was he like? Tell us what Jesus was like. And he would always say, he was all about love. For God so loved the world, John wrote, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This was John's hope. Even as he peered into a tumultuous prophetic future, John remained anchored in his relationship with Jesus, a humble Jewish fisherman called to change the world with his message. It gives you tremendous hope that God will just choose the, you know, the peculiar things, the, the things that are not famous. Somebody that has a heart for God, God will choose them and can use them prophetically in the end times, which is what we really need today. A prophetic church that sees God's purposes for the Jews, God's purposes for, the, for, the, for Israel, what's happening in Islam, what's happening in the Middle East, and how it impacts the whole world. Today in Israel, it seems as though the stage is being set for the final battle John predicted in the book of Revelation. From the nations and people surrounding Israel come endless threats to utterly destroy her. Armageddon feels closer than ever before. Yet there is hope. John records that with the end time battle, Israel's Messiah will reappear in Israel to defeat her enemies and his eternal kingdom at last be established. One of the things that John saw was the return of the Lord and saw also that the one he loved so much would be the one that would be worshiped forever and ever, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. He saw Jesus as the one who would bring light to the new Jerusalem. There would be no temple in Jerusalem, but the Lord himself would be that light. So John really not only spoke words of revelation, but his eyes were opened to some of the most uh, profound revelations of what heaven will be and our eternal dwelling with the Lord forever. morning by the Sea of Galilee. Here it all began. Along these shores, Jesus called his first disciples. Mark, the gospel writer, tells us in chapter 1 and verse 14. Now after John, John the Baptist that is, was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, and believe the gospel. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. Consider the cost of discipleship. Zebedee, presumably, 
thought his sons would take over the fishing business, and obviously it was prosperous because there were hired servants as well. But James and John, hearing the call of Jesus, immediately left the boats and followed him. We can only imagine the kind of tensions that that brought in that family. And as they followed him, they were astonished by what he could do, the miracles that he did. And we read, continuing on in Mark chapter 1, Then he went into a synagogue in Capernaum. This is verse uh, 21. And immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. And as the story unfolds in that synagogue, there is a man with evil spirits. And Jesus rebukes those demons and sets the man free. Immediately following that, Simon Peter's mother-in-law is healed of a, fe a fever and she's able to, to serve Jesus and his disciples. And of course, all of the North Shore and around the shores of the Sea of Galilee is abuzz with what is happening. So we read in Mark 1, in verse 32, in Capernaum, on the north shore. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him, to Jesus, all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. And so it all began around these shores. And of course, it went from here in Galilee, south, even to the holy city, Jerusalem itself. A grand adventure for these ordinary men who were simple fishermen, but now had become disciples of the Jewish Messiah. And of course, Jesus died in Jerusalem, was resurrected and ascended. And soon after that, the Holy Spirit, the power of God, fell on the early church. And those first disciples then began to do the very miracles they had seen Jesus do. Imagine their excitement as they went out from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth as witnesses to the power of God and to the person of Jesus of Nazareth. But for James and John, an awful reversal takes place in Acts chapter 12, verse 1. Now about that time Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread, meaning the Passover. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him four by four. 16 soldiers charged with keeping Peter secure in the prison. And then it says, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Herod didn't want to cause problems, and having a trial or, in fact, an execution during Passover would not have been acceptable to the Jewish authorities in Jerusalem. So he put him in prison, secured him with 16 presumably chosen soldiers to keep him there, and then later he would deal with Peter the same way he had dealt with James, presumably by beheading or crucifixion. But an angel is sent to that prison, and Peter is set free, miraculously set free. And here's the irony. It all happens in chapter 12 of the book of Acts. John is beheaded, yet Peter is set James, rather, is beheaded, but Peter is set free. Imagine what John must have been thinking. How is it that my brother, they'd been inseparable brothers. How is it my brother, God allowed my brother to be beheaded? Yet Peter, an angel sent for him, and he is delivered. You know, that's the hard question of life that we're sometimes called around dark corners. We don't understand. It's mysterious to us. We really don't know how John responded, surely with grief, but he must have had questions about where was God in all of this, especially when my brother was killed by Herod. But we don't know, but what we do know is John continued on. He was a faithful disciple right to the end. And seemingly, he outlived all the other 
first disciples, who tradition says were martyred, they all died martyr's death for their faith. And then we come to the end of the New Testament, to the book of Revelation, and I think maybe we get a clue why James was beheaded and John continued. Because God has something very special in store for John. And that's the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, where the risen Christ appeared to John and showed him the prophetic future. Events that haven't even happened yet as I stand this morning on the south shore of the Sea of Galilee with the sun just coming up over the Golan Heights to my left. And here is how Revelation begins. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God give, gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw, meaning the visions that Jesus gave him. Blessed is he who reads and those who keep the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. That's the, the book of Revelation is the only book in the Bible that carries that idea that to read it, to hear it, uh, brings its own blessings. And so John has a message in verse 4 of Revelation 1, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. These were seven churches in Asia Minor, which today is Western Turkey. And John explains uh, how this vision came to him in verse 9 of Revelation 1. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Patmos was an island in the Aegean Sea, a Roman penal colony, an island prison from which there was no escape. So even in his old age, perhaps even in his 90s, John is suffering uh, for the preaching of the gospel of Christ, to which he has proven a faithful. And he says, I was there for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a voice as of a trumpet. And of course, as this unfolds, it is none other than Jesus of Nazareth speaking to John and giving him these visions. And it begins with seven messages for the seven churches that existed at the time. But some scholars believe that not only what were these messages for those seven churches, these seven churches characterized the church down through history in various stages. And in fact, could be any church today in a certain condition. For example, um, the first church is the Ephesus church, the loveless church, the church that has forgotten to love God and has forgotten God's love. And the second one is uh, Smyrna, the persecuted church. And then we come to Pergamos, the compromising church. And then to Thyatira, the corrupt church. And then the sixth one is Sardis, which is the dead church. And many churches today uh, go through the emotions of faith and Christianity, but they're virtually dead. There's little life, if any life, in them. And then the final condition of the church, well, actually six is number, uh, is Philadelphia, the faithful church, and then finally the seventh church is Laodicea, the lukewarm church. Here's what John writes of it in verse 14 of chapter 3. These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither hold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot, so then, because you were lukewarm and neither cold or, nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing. Do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. This is a message from Jesus for this church and for the other six churches as well. But it ends with an invitation that comes from the Lord in Revelation 3, in verse 19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Jesus here gives an invitation. It's the same invitation he gave by the shores of the Sea of Galilee at the very outset of his ministry to Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, to James and his 
brother John, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And then he says in verse 21 of chapter 3, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. John the Apostle was an overcomer. He survived persecution, imprisonment in a Roman penal colony, and worst of all, the death of his brother at the hands of King Herod. And Jesus says, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And we today should be listening to the voice of God, that still small voice that calls us, speaks to us, sometimes even rebukes us, but always gives us direction and speaks to us out of God's love for us. Well, as this book unfolds beyond the message to the seven churches, we have seven seal judgments, seven trumpet judgments, and finally seven bowl judgments. And each judgment, it seems, is worse than the one before, as God pours out his wrath on a world that has turned away from him. And finally, in a sense, when we get to um, Revelation 16, and we read about the gathering together of the nations of the world to a valley in Israel called Armageddon. John saw this. He saw it vividly and writes of it in Revelation 16. And he says, verse 15, Behold, I am coming as a thief. This is Jesus speaking. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon, that broad expanse of valley that's not far from here. And the culmination of human history, according to the Bible, will take place in that valley when Jesus Christ, the Messiah of Israel, the Savior of the whole world, returns to the land where he was born and deals with evil in that valley called Armageddon. The Apostle John was a very old man when Jesus appeared to him on the island of Patmos in the Aegean Sea and gave him visions of the prophetic future, visions which haven't even happened as I stand here today in the Valley of Armageddon. John saw the mother of all battles, Armageddon, that would take place here in this valley. But over my shoulders on the hills, the town of Nazareth, in Jesus' day, growing up there, it was a small village. Presumably he played there with the other children. But what did he understand about the prophetic future? We know that at the age of 12, his parents took him along with the other children of Nazareth to Jerusalem to celebrate the feasts of the Lord. And then they lost him for a time and found him in the temple debating with the wise men, scholars, presumably the rabbis. And those learned men of Israel were astonished at his knowledge at the age of 12. But if he understood those things at the age of 12, he didn't leave here until he was 30 to begin his formal ministry. What did he understand in the years that followed through his teens and into his 20s? And in days when he would look out over the vast expanse of the Valley of Armageddon, what did his prophetic insight allow him to see? One day, Jesus of Nazareth is returning to the land of Israel. And the Bible says that he will fight here the mother of all battles and put down the forces of darkness and evil that have ravaged the earth. This is the message of our times. We're living in prophetic times. Israel is reestablished in her homeland given by the Almighty God. But we need to take this message as the clock ticks on the prophetic future, we need to reach the nations with the message of Jesus Christ and the revelation he gave to John, the last surviving apostle.